one of the most remote places on Earth. This is where global warming is very real. Greenland is the world's biggest island. 85% of it is ice. And it's warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet. For the few people here, climate change is very, very personal. Even in the height of the Arctic summer, the Ilulisat glacier is a remarkable sight. But the crevices tell a worrying story for scientists. They show it's moving, and faster than any other glacier in the world, doubling to 15 kilometers a year, and all because of the temperature. Scientists here say they've seen an abnormally high rate of melting. And what happens when this ice melts is that the water finds its way to the bottom of the glacier and acts as a lubricant, taking the whole glacier out towards the sea where it breaks off into icebergs. It's already estimated that here in Greenland, enough ice breaks off into the sea every day to supply all of the water for 30 cities the size of New York. It means the sea level could rise sooner than anyone had expected. The reaction time of the ice sheet is brought down a lot. So perhaps the, the, the final reaction of a climate change is the same as we thought before, but the time with which it happens, I think we have to revise our view on that. It's going to happen a lot faster. The Greenlandic people are the best judges of what's happening. The ice is thinner, less and less are they using sled dogs to take them to fish through holes in the ice. It isn't safe. But I believe you have two great advantages. First, the scientific evidence that today is, uh, I would say, clear, astonishing clear. Secondly, the support of our public opinion globally, namely also in the United States, that is changing. So I'm confident, a lot of things to do, but honestly, I'm confident about this challenge. This landscape has seen changes in the climate before. People here have had to adapt. While the rest of the world watches, the fear, not just here, is that this time it could be irreversible, that it could already be too late. So today we are gathered on all seven continents in eight giant concerts and in 10,000 other gatherings, many as large as this one. Two billion people we are gathered with one message. And I hope that all of you will join in taking the live earth seven-point pledge, and here are the words. I pledge to demand that my country join an international treaty within the next two years that cuts global warming pollution by 90% in developed countries and by more than half worldwide in time for the next generation to inherit a healthy earth. I pledge to take personal action to help solve the climate crisis by reducing my own CO2 pollution and offsetting the rest to become carbon neutral. I pledge to fight for a moratorium on the construction of any new generating facility that burns coal without safely trapping and storing the CO2. I pledge to work for a dramatic increase in the energy efficiency of my home, workplace, school, place of worship, and means of transportation. I pledge to fight for laws and policies that expand the use of renewable energy sources and reduce dependence on oil and coal. I pledge to plant new trees and to join with others in preserving and protecting forests. And I pledge to buy from businesses and support leaders who share my commitment to solving the climate crisis and building a sustainable, just, and prosperous world for the 21st century. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, not many years from now, our children and grandchildren will ask one of two questions. They will look back at us in 2007, at the beginning of the 21st century, and either they will ask, what were they thinking? Didn't they hear the scientists? Didn't they see the evidence. Were they too busy, distracted, or greedy? Didn't they care? Or they will ask a second question, the one I much prefer that they ask. I want them to ask of us, how did they get their act together and find the uncommon moral courage to rise and successfully solve the climate crisis? 
there have been shifts in the U.S. The Congress has now begun passing legislation that makes significant changes. Many of the state and local governments, as I've mentioned, have already done so. Uh, and the pressure within the president's own party has been growing. It is not impossible that before the end of his term he might make a real shift. I don't think that what happened at Helgen Dam qualified them. Because, I mean, Tony Blair was very enthusiastic about it. I mean, he said he thought that it was a historic yeah. moment that you had. I didn't agree with that. I, I agree with him on most things, and I compliment him on his leadership. But I, I did not agree with uh, that, that what uh, President Bush uh, said uh, at Helgen Dam was a significant change. Al Gore, thank you very much indeed.